Well, here we are in Indianapolis. We're on the road to recovery. We're about to meet Scott Mitchell, a guy that's uh, not only a good friend, but an advocate, someone who's helping people, someone who's gone to any length, including putting billboards up to get people help. Scott Mitchell's a guy you'll never forget. My addiction began um, at 13 years old. Uh, that was that was the very first time I ever tried a tobacco product, uh, smoking a cigarette, and um, I really think that uh, that that's that's where a lot of addictions start for people uh, is with tobacco. Scott was a firstborn, um, a wonderful little boy, very well mannered, but very reserved and very quiet, and. Um, when he was five years old, we took him to Riley Children's Hospital and he was diagnosed with um, depression. And fast forward into grade school and high school, he was never again a discipline problem, but he struggled very much and was um, on trial doses for ADD medication. And um, again, he just struggled. Every school year was a struggle just to get him to the next year. I was over at a friend's house for the weekend and basically uh, we were doing everything that you shouldn't be doing. Um, smoking cigarettes, uh, stealing candy from the gas station, um, stole those little, uh, like those little travel packs of alcohol that you would get on a plane. Um, his parents had some of those, so we were drinking uh, some of those. And um, and then also one of the kids that came over um, had a little bit of weed. So I mean, it was like a whole um, bad boy weekend packed into one. I grew up a very loving family, brother and sister. Um, you know, parents loved us, uh, you know, taught us right from wrong, grew up out in the country. Um, we weren't rich, rich by any means, but we had, you know, we were, uh, had whatever we needed to get by. I lived in a nice house, um, and, and so, um, you would think, you know, that, that kind of lifestyle you wouldn't lead into a, a drug addiction or, um, uh, be somebody that would travel down the wrong road. So this whole weekend while I'm doing this stuff, like in the back of my mind, I know that I shouldn't be doing it because my whole life I've been taught, you know, you shouldn't be smoking cigarettes, you shouldn't be drinking alcohol, you know, that's bad. Um, but while I'm right there in the moment and doing it, it was like, it was awesome, it was fun, you know, because we were um, breaking the rules, you know, and uh, I, I felt that acceptance uh, because I was, I was with the cool kids, you know. Um, and, and from that moment on, uh, I really think it was just a lot of uh, bad choices. Throughout high school, um, I never, you know, I never really did too much. Um, but if something got brought up to me, uh, I wouldn't turn it down. Um, so there's a little bit of experimenting, you know, pills. And uh, I can remember one day in my senior year in high school, um, a kid brought some uh, uh, some Xanax to school, and he's like, "Here, try these." And I was like, "Okay." And um, that whole day of school, I don't I don't even remember that day, um, you know, from taking them pills. Um, so I was kind of a kid that that uh, never really went out looking for stuff, but um, there wasn't anything that I wouldn't turn down. I turned to drugs and alcohol to wipe those, uh, to numb myself, you know, um, because I had all these feelings inside and I had to escape. I, I didn't know how to deal with them. The only way I knew how to deal with them was drugs and alcohol. During that time of all the time that you bring up a child and raise them to learn um, living skills and coping skills, we were so focused on him just getting his homework done and struggling for a C or a D at the time. And so when he got out into life, he just didn't have the coping skills that we should have taught him. The drug addiction didn't start all at once. Um, and when he was not contacting me or not staying in contact with me on a regular basis, that's when I knew that 
things were the worst. And it was just, you know, it was just an ongoing cycle. Um, I'd have my times of doing good, um, and then I would fall back down. This friend of mine, he was a real good friend, you know, I knew him all the way through high school. Um, he was kind of like, uh, uh, you know, almost like a brother, but not really. Uh, and and he, he introduced me to heroin. When he introduced me to that, um, you know, again, I just have this mindset of, uh, I don't care what it is, you know, will it get me high? And uh, uh, if it'll get me high, then I want to do it. So um, he shot me up and uh, I instantly, really, that's the only thing I remember. The last thing I remember was him shooting me up. And the next thing I know, I'm waking up in the emergency room. Um, with all this stuff, you know, all these cords and stuff in my nose and, um, you know, I just, I, I don't remember hardly anything. Probably the, the, the first time that he overdosed um, was probably one of the scariest. I was um, at home and heard a knock on my door around 10 in the evening and one of his friends whom I knew uh, was on the other side of the door and was shaking and trembling and crying and asked me if I knew where Scott was and um, of course I didn't and I said what happened and he said he was at my house we were watching a game someone gave him something and the next thing I know he was on the floor and everyone left so of course I rushed to our nearby hospital um, and that's where he was and they would not let me see him. Um, they said that more than likely there was brain damage because he had been, um, uh, he was down to two breaths per minute and um, um, they were gonna ship him to another hospital because they were not equipped to deal with um, the overdose. By the grace of God, one of the uh, young men that was there called his girlfriend who worked at the hospital and she said call 911 and um, I'm not sure exactly who did but when they found him he was very very blue and um, non-respondent and took him took them a while to get him um, back to where he was breathing again um, so that was that was definitely a very, very scary time for our family. Um, immediately afterwards, his father and I took him to a treatment center in Indianapolis um, and they would not take him unless he had been detoxed for 30 days. Well, by that time, he couldn't have any traces of um, any alcohol or drugs in his system. I really had a wake up call after that. You know, I started doing good. Um, I wanted to to be a better person and not go down this life anymore, but eventually uh, that that took a turn. Um, I had a job uh, working on a farm and uh, ended up hurting my back, so they prescribed me to prescription pain pills, and um, it was just right back to the, off to the races after that. You know, so now I'm a full-blown heroin addict, um, doing everything I can to get it. Um, it just started out, like I said, it started out snorting it, just doing it on the weekends. And then it became like weekends and uh, maybe three nights a week. And then it became every single day. And then I started shooting it. And then so, you know, now I'm doing it constantly as much as I can. Um, if I'm not... If I'm not doing heroin, I'm out chasing that high. I'm out uh, trying to do something, steal something um, from family, um, whatever I can to make some money to be able to go to the dope man down in the city and, and get some heroin. He had a severe wreck um, where he should have been killed. Um, he was airborne, hit a 30-foot pine tree his truck crashed into the tree. The tree came down on top of his truck and um, they, everyone that showed up at the scene thought he was dead. I didn't want to believe that my 
little son um, who was always so precious and, you know, never a minute's trouble, just um, a lost kid. I never wanted to believe that my son was the son that was on drugs. At this moment, uh, that's my third uh, OWI. Um, and uh, many years of heartache and, and hardships with my family. Trust, you know, loss of trust and, and just a um, point of no return. Uh, while I was in jail, um, here at my local county, they did a, uh, they have a drug treatment program. Going through that program um, is when I really, uh, I did my first step in the program where you have to write out your story and um, once I wrote out my story and I looked back on it and I was reading it, I was just like, wow, you know, this is, this is craziness. I can't believe that I'm even alive, you know, here today. As soon as I got back home, though, I mean, I was fired up. I was motivated to do good things. Um, I was, I knew that the next time that I would probably use, I would probably either end up dead or back in prison. And, um, but something inside of me just said, you know, one more time. Um, I've been locked up for 10 months. Um, I'm out. It's time to uh, celebrate. And, and all, you know, one more time won't hurt me. Again, he was really doing well, but I started noticing a couple of um, things in his personality where he would stay in his room and he wasn't as sociable as he was when he had first gotten home. And... Um, he came home early one morning and I was on the couch, I was sick, and he said, I'm going to go upstairs because I'm, I don't feel good and I don't want you to get what I have. And within three to four minutes, I hear this loud noise and that will be a noise that I'll never forget. Um, so I called for his name and he didn't answer. So I ran up the door upstairs and um, the door to his room was shut. So I opened the door and I found him on the floor with um, a band around his arm and a needle sticking out of his arm. And he was not breathing, he was unresponsive, um, he was blue. And so I immediately started CPR and um, I had left my cell phone downstairs so I ran I gave him a couple of breaths and uh, compressions and I ran downstairs to get my cell phone to call 911 and um, ran back upstairs to continue CPR until um, the medics were here and the first officer that got here um, he told me to continue CPR until the EMTs so I remember him standing over me watching me give Scott CPR and at that time Scott had thrown up so um, I wiped his mouth clean and continued CPR and um, again that's a scene in my head that I'll never forget of watching him um, still after all of that he was unresponsive and uh, the EMTs came and um, they sent me downstairs and they gave him a couple of doses of Narcan. And again, another thing I'll never forget is them, one of the MTs yelling down the stairs to a police officer that was down here sitting with me and saying, we have a pulse. And um, um, Being honest, this was after 12 years of Scott struggling. And as his mom, being probably the closest person that knew lots about Scott and to watch him struggle from preschool up to high school in several facets of his life and not being able to help him for a nanosecond before I started CPR, I said to myself and had the thought to myself, is it better just to let him rest? Because his struggle was so deep and so miserable.
and it was just as miserable for our family. But God had a bigger plan. And um, I took that shot and it was too much and, you know, fell out, overdosed. Um, my mom had to come up and, and give me mouth to mouth and, uh, you know, I almost, uh, almost died right there, you know, for the second time. And uh, after just being locked up for 10 months. Um, but that was the final moment that I decided that drugs were not going to ruin my life anymore. And that was the best decision I've ever made in my life. You know, he's a perfect example of someone who not only affects his life, but the lives of people around him. But as important as that is to remember, it's important to understand the importance of family in your recovery. Things have just been amazing. I took that first year and worked on myself. Um, and now under this, uh, the second year, I've been uh, doing a ton of stuff in recovery. And um, I'm two and a half years clean and just absolutely loving every part of life and recovery. Um, those overdoses and, and this whole experience of 12 years of drug use have just been, um, you know, um, I went through all that for a reason. Um, God, God knew exactly what He was going to do with me. He put me on a path, and um, you know, I don't know that He He led me to shooting up heroin, but He knew exactly what um, everything I was going through would lead up to, and uh, and it's just amazing, um, you know, how God works and how. Um, we can really reach people through recovery, and um, I just love every every minute of life now. You know, now I get a chance to reach kids, not only reach kids, but also people that are out there still struggling, and um, and I can direct them down a path towards recovery. It's just amazing works. I love it. So one of the one of the ideas that I came up with was um, I was looking through Facebook one day and I seen a picture of a billboard and it had called 211 for help on the bottom of it. And that sparked an, an idea in my head about uh, putting up something here in our county with a billboard on it talking about uh, you know one of the places that heroin will lead you is death. And um, I posted that on Facebook and I got a huge response from it. Uh, so somebody said make a GoFundMe page. So I did, made a GoFundMe page. Got a lot of media attention. Uh, within two weeks I had enough money to put up a billboard. And this is what I came up with. You know, one way to stop using heroin and uh, the picture of the casket. Uh, because really, there's really only two, two way or two uh, paths that heroin use will lead you down, which is either Jeff, death or jail. And uh, so I, I just had to had to put something like this up so that way get more um, awareness, more attention, put my phone number on it um, so that way if people see it and they want help, they want to get out of this struggle, they call me and uh, and you know I can hopefully lead them to treatment, lead them to a new life. I mean, I've probably gotten over 200 phone calls total since the billboard's been up, and you know these people are just—they're getting help. They're get—they're getting—you uh, know—they're getting a chance at a new life. Scott Mitchell is a guy who inspires me, who motivates me, and who, in sharing his story with others, hopes to reach as many people as possible on his path to recovery. We'll see you on the next episode of On the Road to Recovery. I'm Michael DeLeon.